camera. All right, everyone. Um, this report here is not only how we use dynamics. First of all, sound check. Does everyone hear me OK? Yep, you sound great. <clears throat> so Montgomery County, uh, who are we? What are we? How we got to where we are? And yes, if you happen to live in Montgomery County or work <laughs> in Montgomery County, um, I actually and my team work for you as well. Uh, so there's multiple facets that we do constantly throughout. But a little introduction here, if I can get my screens to work correctly. And let's go to here and see what happens. Okay. I'm not sure how many of you understand, but there's actually 18 counties in the United States named Montgomery. So normally when I introduce myself, Montgomery County, we usually have to say Pennsylvania because most of the people around here would say Maryland. So as you can see by these slides that these are the listing of those counties. And yes, Montgomery County is listed in there as well. So we are a county about 20 miles outside of the center of Philadelphia, and we are governed by a uh, board of commissioners which has three members. Right now it's two Democratic and one Republican member. And our county consists of about 850,000 residents here or take, and some of the other additional uh, tidbits there. So <clears throat> moving on, um, this is kind of like how we got to where we are today. Back in the year 2013, my boss, Anthony Alaviri, called me into his office and said, what do you know about CRM? I thought, I said nothing, but I will do some searching. Apparently CRM at that point was added to our county enterprise agreement that we had with Montgomery mm -hmm. County. So I did some searching and was given permission to go to this thing called convergence. I'm not sure if anyone ever joined into that, but um, we were allowed to go into convergence. And so we packed our bags and we went to that particular year. It was held in Atlanta, Georgia, and we actually stayed in that um, building in the right hand side there, the one that looks like a cylinder. <clears throat> and in that particular year, uh, I heard some interesting quotes and stuck with me. And it's really like there isn't anything you can't do with dynamics. I mean, you could do everything. They said, you know, everything you possibly could do, you could do with dynamics. In fact, uh, in a user group like this one that we're in, they actually demonstrated how they developed the game Monopoly and to be used within the CRM platform. That year, um, as most people know, if you go to Microsoft, there's usually a large um, celebration or concert, and it was given by a group known as Fun, which I never heard of, and only knew one of their songs, but my grandchildren were really impressed that I was seeing that particular group. Again, in 2015, we went back to Atlanta, and we, learned more and more of that information. In fact, we met another member of the uh, user group meeting here, Dan Madden, who was in presentation. And that particular year, One Republic uh, was doing the concert. Okay, so now what? I heard about this thing called CRM and it was like nothing the county has ever done before. Most of our development at that point in time that I was involved with was with Microsoft Access. And yeah, our best guess, we had over 200 different databases that we had to maintain or develop, and we continually moved ahead in that particular direction, or we hired vendors to create uh, solutions for us. Now, because we are a government agency, we just can't go out and buy things that look good if we had the money to do so. We actually have to have the commissioners um, agree upon it. And what we normally do most of our uh, purchasing is through an RFP or request for proposal. We can get away a little bit and if it is underneath a state contract, but there are certain rules and regulations that we need to follow. So finally, the commissioners approved the IT department to write and publish a total of three 
RFPs. So in that 2015, we wrote two RFPs, as you see on the screen here. One was for SharePoint and one was for CRM. And the goal of the RFP actually, as that statement says down there, is to augment my the development staff. In other words, find a partner uh, that would be able to come aboard and help develop applications and also transfer of knowledge. So my team uh, would be able to go ahead and with that development and we're not dependent upon as we have been caught in the past with vendors. And you notice I will say vendors or partners. A partner to me is really someone who is looking out for the county, uh, willing to go that extra mile as compared to some of the other uh, vendors that we had that seem to be looking out for them and seeing what dollars they can get from us. So <clears throat> we had started out and we finally had uh, selected our uh, approved partner and we had the contracts signed and we thought we were going to start with the health and human service initiative, which at that point in time, we had nine totally different uh, departments running their own entities, running their own access databases or applications, and no one knowing what the other one was doing. So we thought we would be starting with that, which would be a major lift. However, some of the powers to be around the county changed things and said, you know, we need to bring the tax claim system back in house. At that point, it was set up to a, another vendor. And so, when I say there, a very short order, we got the notice that we needed to be um, February 8th of 2016. We needed to bring that back up and get ready to go. And it's almost like, you know, I've always heard that by yesterday. Uh, and so February 8th, that announcement was made and I made the announcement to the team on February 12th, I'm going out for a complete knee operation and we'll be out for several weeks so my team and our partner quickly got together and designed the capability of starting the steps of producing tax claim which is the management of all delinquent real estate taxes and now let me introduce you to my team you've heard most of them through the introductions but my team consists of Don Sassy, who is the .NET developer, Kathy Cypress is a senior analyst developer and also my documenter, Vince Alanieri, who is listed here as the business analyst. He just recently moved into that spot and he is also with me for um, development, mainly around uh, children and youth. Patricia Murphy and Don Eaton are associated over with the MIS analysts and they are heavily connected to our health and human services area. So this is who I am. Uh, I got, I frown a lot. So uh, we started, I started in the county with uh, October of 94. I was the first help desk operator at the county. I then became a developer, then also became the development manager. Uh, and I lead the wonderful team that helps get into Office 365, Dynamics, SharePoint. And we continually moved on through 2016 all the way up into this wonderful year of 2020. And then a lot of things started to happen, such as a shutdown. <clears throat> and so you can see here, it's just an illustration that everything in 2020 seems to be going differently. We were sent home. In fact, Patricia Murphy started on March the 9th and on March the 10th, we were all working from home. So imagine starting a brand new job and not really being trained on what that job's about and now trying to figure out how am I gonna do whatever I'm supposed to do. And yet I'm in an isolation of working from home. So we've been using a lot of team meetings and going through a lot of training. So let me talk about the philosophy, how we handle things. Um, and that's most of the time. So right now our dynamic uh, environments are set up in different groups of which we have four. And in those environments, each one of those, we have a sandbox or a development area where all the development and modifications are 
to take place. Once the end user takes care of that, we move them into the UAT and then finally into production. <laughs> so in Sandbox, we do all the creation and modifications of all solutions. And once after showing it to our end users, they say, yeah, that looks exactly what we need. We export an unmanaged solution and we put it into UAT where the end users can go in and test and be trained on how to use the application. So it either goes to the direction of, no, I need some additional changes, which means we put it back into the dev box and that cycle continues until they finally say, okay, that's exactly what we need. So then we take that solution that was pushed into UAT and we put it into production. This slide shows you all the different applications that currently we actually have. So in group one, you can see that we have the tax claim, the planning commission, public defenders, HR, domestic relations actually has two. I won't read everything in the group uh, two here, but that is all for health and human services, that each one of those represents different uh, county departments, but they're utilizing one environment and we handle um, everything in heavily customized because yes, around health and human services, I'm sure you've heard the word HIPAA. We need to make sure that nothing, nothing is in violation in there. And we continually have that conversation as to why do we have to do that since we all work for the same organization? <laughs> and then in group three and group four, they're individual uh, applications. You notice the asterisks are the ones that are indicating that we actually have integrated our dynamics with SharePoint. So as a system administrator, if we would go into these different environments, you can see the different tiles that we are able to go into where if an end user, they would only see one of those tiles, such as the domestic relations, they only see the ones that they go into or public defenders and planning commission is the one I'm actually going to be demonstrating uh, later on. These are the tiles for our health and human services. And at that point, I wanna to stop to talk about our third RFP, which was for our master data. Having looked at all the different access databases, I could actually find an individual in almost every one of them, or maybe in majority of them, but their information would be possibly changed because from the one entry in the record to the next entry, they might have moved or changed the phone number or what have you. So we solicited and received um, a partner that we use for master data. And you notice the bottom circle is for dynamics and it has a two-way two arrow, which means that new records from dynamics go into the master data and make a full circle back to dynamics. Because what it's doing is checking to make sure that it is a unique record. Uh, the circles on the left or right are other what we call source records. Uh, SAMS is for our senior services and it is a state system that we pull down files directly from that, put it in the master data. If there's new records, it's added into Dynamics. Likewise, over in the right-hand circle, it's from the Office of Children and Youth and that is actually housed within a SQL server on our um, premise. So we go back and forth and this is how we try to maintain a unique record for all the consumers and the entities for consumers and providers are shown throughout all those different applications that you saw on group two. This is for our disease tracking. And yes, this is for those individuals. Unfortunately, you might have actually received a positive um, COVID test and so you might actually have had tracers call you to see how your symptoms are and we track all that in this particular dynamic uh, application. This, if you happen to 
gone through the registration through the county, you might have seen this screen itself. And it is really in the, the Microsoft vaccination management system that is behind the scenes using power apps and dynamics to regulate and also track those individuals who have gone off to county vaccination sites um, in that direction. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here. Hopefully things will work well. And let me go over to here, drag it to our screen, and hopefully now you actually do see a uh, MCPC portal. Heidi, yep. do you see that? Yeah, we do. Okay, so you see I'm logged in here as Harry Heiser, and what this particular application is, is the planning commission of the county gets requests from each municipality asking them to review um, plans or various things that the commission is sanctioned to go through and verify that uh, in a case of development, there's enough uh, parking spaces or the houses aren't crammed or all the sewers and everything else that under the, the sun possibility uh, that needs to be approved and a letter is sent back to the municipality and normally within a 30 day period of review. So let me show you again, this uh, website was developed by Don Sassy or .NET application. So a municipality official would be logged in here. They would look for an applicant. They could either create a brand new applicant, or as you can see, Mickey's been our applicant here, and this is all in UAT for testing purposes. So I can go ahead and select Mickey. And so I'm over here in this area, and now what I need to do is select an applicant type. We had the municipality, other government, and school districts. Those are done from a free standpoint, but if I select a private, then we can go and I will go ahead and just throw a name out there. And it is, it's just free tax. It is going to be held within this municipality of uh, Lower Providence. And so now what I need to do is throw in who is the applicant representation and I will use myself and it's supposed to be the full name but that doesn't matter because remember this is UAT two six three eight four and my email address and yes if you do happen to call that phone number you would get me <clears throat> and this is my work email address as well uh, doo -doo -doo. And going down here, putting just information because you notice the asterisks on the screen, meaning this is a requirement. And I am going to select subdivision, but any one of these action items down here is available. And you notice sometimes we have our question marks. So if we hover over it, the individual can know what those mean. So when I hit the word save, you'll notice up here that the proposal type and the proposal number are blank, but hitting save. And let me hit, uh, oh. The phone number must indicate. Yeah, you're missing one digit. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it. Thank you. That's Welcome. really good data validation on that form. Nice job, team. <clears throat> so now let's see what happens. And so down here, you can see that it was saving. And OK, now I have a proposal number, and it is a plan only, so forth. But let me jump over to our dynamic product. And let's go down to proposals. And I am going to go ahead and sort this in this direction. And you notice that the park house with Mickey Mouse is in here. And if I open this particular one up, 
it is in what we call preparation state. In other words, the municipality official is not done filling out their information. But if they would have a question, someone in the planning commission would be able to jump onto this record and they would be able to see exactly what this particular person is filling in over here. So moving to the next slide, this is where we would put kind of like a general location of where this particular proposal is. And again, this could be any type of proposal uh, that the municipality is taking a look at it. So I can go Maine and Trooper, and then I would select that it is this final here. It's not a resubmission. I would fill in you know what would be applicable for that particular proposal and then i would move ahead to the next area and so what i would need to do in the county of montgomery we have what is known as a parcel number they are 12 digits so trust me i might miss a digit but i'm not trying to and two three nine six six seven one uh, and then I'm going to hit save. We could add additional parcel numbers if needed, or we could change it, or we could delete it. We'll just leave it at that for this particular demo. And moving over here, this is a land use code environment that the Planning Commission has selected. And all this is being actually pulled out of our dynamic uh, option set. So I am going to go ahead and select this single home because it is a residential. I do not need to fill out the building square foot. If it was like for commercial buildings and everything, then I, I would need to fill in that. But I do need to fill in the number of lots and I'm going to do one. And in this particular case, I'm going to say there are three units. And I'm going to hit save on that. We could actually now, once this is back to me, add additional, um, you know, open space or anything of that nature. But for the demo purposes, we will move ahead here. <clears throat> and so now this is where we can go ahead and have that municipality official go to choose a file. And I will be choosing this one. Yes, I know it says Bridgeport, but just to give you an idea, and we could have them say, what is this type of document? And this actually is a plan. And so we could go and hit upload. And as the world spins, it's uploading to a SharePoint folder, which I'll show you in a moment. We could add more um, in here because sometimes they have almost as up to 10 different um, documentations that they want our planning commission to review and so moving ahead here this is general text now normally what happens is our planning commission reviewers might go out to the different municipality when they have board meetings or uh, planning commission meetings down to that level they might put in remarks in here and tell them when the next meeting is going to be so they would be in correspondence to that for now we're just going to leave that blank and then this actually is what the fee is being charged back to the applicant so mickey would need to come up with 150 dollars uh, when this particular um, proposal is indeed um approved so i'm going to hit proceed and what that basically is saying okay you're about ready to go ahead and submit this and is everything correct we could go back and change anything if we needed to at this point in time because it still is in that preparation mode over in dynamics but i'm going to go ahead and hit submit so it is now submitted. So the municipality official could actually go back and hit the home and we could go down to submit it, the proposals. And you can see that the one that I just submitted is listed here, or they could go down to the other ones that they had submitted over the past 
several times. Um, and that really concludes what we do from the municipality officials. So now it's over into the um, reviewers and in the maintenance of the different people in planning commission. We start out with the dashboard that if a proposal is submitted to me as a reviewer, it would show up in my um, dashboard here. And a lot of this, remember, we're in UAT, so, and this is just for demo purposes, we have all these different dashboards. So what we can go into now is as we did before, and we would go ahead and uh, sort this again and open up the particular proposal that we had put into uh, Dynamics. And then moving across, you can see where, if you remember, I put in the main and location, and yes, the number of acres and what's being impacted. Uh, this is the action where we selected just the subdivision, our land use codes, our parcel, our fees, the plans and details is just factors of how we got to the amount of money that we looked at. But moving all the way across to this particular tab for documents, this is a grid that was built for us to be able to pull in, and this is not out of the box document uh, management, but you can see that we have the file that I uploaded and multiple columns are not been filled in as of yet. So if we go to uh, everything and notice that up here that the status right now is received. In other words, the planning commission has received this. They're reviewing it, making sure they don't have any questions of any of the things that the municipality official has filled out. So they would go into uh, the review tab and actually at that point in time, then they would go and assign it a MCPC number. And yet if we tab off of that, um, it would, let me back up here and remove some of that. Okay, so now it's not doing that. But anyway, there's an error message there as well. <clears throat> so if we put in today's date, It assigns when the review date is in indeed uh, required. And if we go and save this particular record, it takes the status from the verified to, I mean, from the received and uh, to verified. So you can see that it has this out here, but if we go back to the documents, and refresh the screen. Back over to here. You can see now in the SharePoint folder, these particular columns were filled in. So what happens now is that if we go back over to the payment area, sorry, not the payment area, the fee area, <clears throat> We can say, OK, we've got this and we can go ahead and. There usually is an icon up here for sending an invoice and right now I don't see it, but oh, we have multiple forms as well in here. So depending on what form you're on is how things are. You know, this document was over the way here in the right, and now it's over here in the the towards the left. And we have a tab up here to send an email invoice. So we can go to this and we can say, okay, it was sent. And if I go over to my Outlook, open up my Outlook and pull that over to your screen that you should see. You notice that it, I have the uh, SharePoint alerts on saying, okay, this um, proposal has been added and these has been updated. 
And then once again, this was updated with the additional tags in that area. And then eventually I would receive an email. Right now it's showing that Don Sassy sent it. But this email is being sent, in a sense it would be sent to the applicant. And then they would be able to click on this uh, tab. It would go over to this once again, showing them the invoice that we sent to them. And so they could go out here and say, okay, how do I want to pay it? And you can go and either pay it by a personal check and just letting you know that if we make this payment, it does give you this reference. Now, this is not on the county site. This is on a third party um, because the county is not allowed to receive and capture any payment uh, information. So what we do need to do, as you notice down here in this, if you click on this, you will receive also on top of the $150 in this case, a $1.50 convenience fee. If we would have gone over to the, um, the other application, uh, you would see that we would be charging 2.65 uh, convenience fee for a credit card. And in another application, we have actually received as high as $9,500 for a payment. Uh, so you can tell that that was pre pretty costly for the convenience fee, but that was that particular person's um, willingness to do that. As you can see right here, 2.65. So, Having had all of that, that really uh, shows you how we are do doing that. Uh, and also because I am a system admin in the system, if I click on the planning commission, you can see that I can go from one application to the next. Harry, can I ask you a quick question? You certainly can. This, first of all, very impressive stuff. And you've obviously tightly integrated a lot of different systems with Dynamics. So I'm curious how you run those integrations. Are they custom integrations? Are you using Power Automate? Are you using other fancy tools we should know about? Um, with inside here, um, let me just jump into this one real quick. This is Tax Claim, which is the one that we first started. Uh, this has really increased a lot better. Uh, we have a lot of areas in here. So each year in this particular case, we need to bring in the new liens and we use TIPCO's um, scribe jobs to bring in data and bring data out of Dynamics. Um, so that is uh, how we bring the data in and take data out from that. Most of the um, entities are all custom entities with wrapped around with all the security that is capable within Dynamics. That answer your question? It does, thank you. I'm so interested in so many parts of this. Like, how in the heck do you manage a security model for something like this? But that's a different question. You don't have to go there if you have more stuff to show us. I uh, know, no, I mean, you know, feel free to ask, I mean, I'll, I I need to give kudos to, well, first of all, you, Heidi, for MVP. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. I know that was a major accomplishment. Thank you. Uh, and my team, um, I get the privilege of saying, all right, get it done. Uh, being a manager yeah. from the standpoint of, you know, that's uh, a great thing about uh, having such a team. And as you saw, Don really did a wonderful job in designing and integrating between Dynamics and uh, the web pages. We actually do have um, portals that we use in our health and human service uh, for our provider management. So that is really um, taking advantage of the portals that is available through Dynamics as well. Um, so we have that included. Are there any other questions before I hand the mic back? How did you get that portal to work? Is it is it Microsoft portals, the um, planning commission 
for the submission portal thing. Don Sassy, you want to jump on and uh, explain? Uh, no, it's actually just a .NET web app that we developed. Um, it uses the uh, Dynamics uh, or CRM uh, DLLs for pulling data and inserting data. The, so the, the application development tools. OK, so it's pulling the data out of CRM in real time and then showing it to these, uh, I guess, what are external users? It is. So basically every drop down that you see in here is pulling from option sets. Um, when they fill out a, a particular screen in the portal, it's updating dynamics in real time. The payment portal uh, where, where they go to the uh, third party to make credit card payments or check payments. They we worked with that company to uh, have web services talk to each other. So once they fill out a payment and submit that, if it's successful, well, first it asks us, you know, do you want to do you accept this payment? Is this a legitimate uh, kind of a handshake thing? And then we respond, yeah, we'll take that payment and if it's successful, we then go into Dynamics and create a payment record, um, which then the Planning Commission will go ahead and they'll basically every day review the payments that came in and match them up with uh, the different proposals that were awaiting payment. OK, so that big front end thing is all really heavily reliant on uh, programming. Then. Yeah. OK. This is really cool. Nice work on it. <clears throat> Thank you. Like I said, though, we do have the um, dynamic portal also more functional over to the um, health and human services. And the other thing that we've uh, started to do, and it's kind of like new technology for us, uh, we actually incorporated the Microsoft Dynamic Export Services for our health and human services, and we're bringing uh, the majority of the important entities into an Azure uh, warehouse. So we can start building some additional Power BI reports off of that so they don't need to actually get into uh, Dynamics. And you got to remember, as much as I say, I, I work for you guys who live and work in Montgomery County. Um, the more we can show in charts and pictures, the more the commissioners appreciate the effort that uh, we are furnishing services to ourselves, in a sense. Uh, but the different constituents without the, within the county, from mental health to drug and alcohol to OCY providers and just the whole gamut, what county entities are all about. Uh, and a lot of times we have to figure out how to handle uh, the interface between state systems to our systems because we find sometimes state systems are lacking the granularity or the detail information that we need from a standpoint, but that they require reporting back up to them. Uh, and their format to our format is totally different. Uh, I made mention that we export things into the SAMs and that has to go into XML and has to hit the certain certain fields and certain numbers and we have that all worked out uh, behind the scenes as well. So I am going to stop presenting. I'm going to I'm going to ask you another question if nobody else has them. Um, so when Harry and I were talking prior to this, I was really impressed by the architecture of this system, right? So you have four tenants and under some of those tenants, you have like 20 plus instances. <clears throat> how how do you manage that from the dynamic standpoint? This might be for more of your team, but I know you mentioned there's only like one entity that they all share and not all of them share it. So how do you manage what gets displayed on each model driven app? Did you build different forms for each table? Do you have tons of business rules firing show and display based on certain conditionals? Uh, are there magic at work? 
Yes, the, the each um, when we talk about uh, exposing what is available to the individual departments in the consumer record, uh, yes, we need to be very cautious as to what is available at this point in time, because a consumer could unfortunately uh, be receiving services from uh, drug and alcohol, which is very sensitive. Uh, but you know they have their own rules and regulations, and they have to sign the papers and you know all that stuff, and they bring in their invoices from the different providers. None of that from a end user standpoint can be seen by other individuals. So in the reality, I mean, the whole hope was, and it is a, I'll use the word struggle, uh, because, you know, we're coming from this uh, paradigm of saying, no one can see what I see. And yet I go back to say, but we work for the same county and are we helping or hindering this individual from a standpoint of giving the services that they need. Uh, and we've been having those type of conversations internally with uh, Veterans Affairs and the various other um, organizations. We bring data in or out for correctional facility uh, because now there's this incentive through the state known as stepping up. And what that stepping up policy is to try to help prevent large incarceration of individuals who, again, unfortunately have uh, mental illness. Uh, you know, I don't think they best serve behind bars, but they might be best served in other uh, facilities. Uh, so we've been working with that and trying to get those reports out. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, when you get behind the scenes of security, um, it becomes a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, and our partner has really been very helpful with that um, and just being able to make sure that we are keeping things squared away. But if I'm in like say community connection, I can see X number of fields. Obviously, you know, the normal ones, like the, everyone has to have a last name, a first name and a date of birth to be able to register in our consumer records. In past that, you don't need a social security number, but you might. Uh, or your address. Um, and so the oddity that we find that sometimes like myself, I'll give you an example real quick. Um, I like to say I live in Trooper. Well, if I'm in the senior services uh, application called SAMS, that's a violation. So if it is in the zip code of 19403, I have to say I live in Norristown, even though I don't like to associate with that town uh, for personal reasons, but that is, so when we put that in there, we have to have a validation behind that saying, okay, the town is Norristown. Uh, one quick strange uh, area here, if I live near Phoenixville, the zip code, and I don't remember off the top of my head real quick, it says, okay, I live in Phoenixville. I truly live in the county of Montgomery, but because of that state system, I have to say Chester County, um, but our senior service um, can be the default um, agency that helps that particular individual out. Very we had to we, we had to fill out those type of rules and regulations, and not to belabor the whole thing, but in all our validations for all the invoices that we bring in, we have a whole contract set up saying, okay, this particular provider can do this particular procedure for this particular point in time. And that's all rule off of a fiscal year. So we could say, no, nope, we can't pay you for this because it's outside the number of uh, rules and regulations. And so our mm -hmm. end users go back and forth with that. Very cool. Harry, thank you so much. That was very interesting to learn about. As someone who lives in Montgomery County, it was even cooler because you get to kind of see the behind the scenes stuff. But thank you so much. This is great. You're quite welcome. Appreciate your time. Um, so we're going to transition over to Matt and Carl. If you guys want to share your screen, they're going to talk about APIs, the most powerful tool anyone can use. Hello. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for that talk. That's quite interesting. Let me uh, share my screen for a second. 
And it's where I press all the buttons and hope they work. Uh, so I want that one. Great. Hopefully you can see that slide. Roll it. Yep. Yeah, we can see Fantastic. it. Fantastic. So um, I am here with my good friend Carl Crookson today to talk to you about APIs, the most powerful tool uh, that anyone can really use. Uh, before we get started, though, we want to say a big congratulations to Heidi. Um, Heidi was awarded the Microsoft MVP award on May 1st at 2021, so just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's an award for, if you don't know, it's an award uh, for outstanding contributions to the community. Uh, and if you're all here now, you probably know that Heidi does that all the time. Uh, and it's just Microsoft catching up and recognizing her for that award. So big congratulations, Heidi. Um, Thank it's, you. It's I like that you put Gritty on the slide too. Well, I, so one of my uh, one of my good friends, Emma Darcy, uh, moved to Philly, um, and she's always talking about Gritty. So uh, that's my <laughs> contribution to why this is a Philadelphia user group. Um, so yeah. Um, so the agenda today. So we're going to talk about um, intros first. We're going to talk about what is an API. We're going to talk about using an API in Power Automate, using it in a Canvas app. Um, some custom connectors with authenticated APIs. We're going to wrap up with any questions and things like that at the end. Um, so we kind of will be talking about um, different aspects kind of on the on the fringes of Dynamics a little bit. But everything that you kind of see here today and that we're going to go through today, you can implement into your dynamic systems. Um, this talk is all about trying to break down those barriers from uh, sort of like, you know, regular uh, end users to citizen devs to developers to, you know, everyone else um, to allow you to use such a powerful tool that is just at your fingertips and just requires a little bit of knowledge. So to start with, I'm going to pass it over to my friend Carl to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Carl. Um, um, I am. Uh, I work for a solution. Sorry, I work for Avanod as a solution architect um, in the UK. So I usually work with a lot of enterprise customers doing large implementations of D365 and Power Platform. Um, I also have quite a few tools within the XRM toolbox. So if people are used to that, you'll see my name in and around there um, under Link D365. Yeah, and I am uh, Matt Collins Jones. You can call me MCJ. Uh, I'm a solution architect for D365 and the Power Platform for a company called PSG here in the UK. Uh, we're a Microsoft partner that does implementations uh, around Dynamics, um, like both CE, uh, BC, uh, and all the Power Platform. I'm an XRM Toolbox fan. Um, I, I asked Carl to introduce himself because he makes some awesome tools in the XRM Toolbox, uh, and I'm a big fan of his. So you should definitely check out his tools, especially ones around like um, entity relationship diagrams and, and flow mappings and stuff like that. All awesome tools that you should definitely check out. Uh, Carl is now blushing uh, in the background because he hates when I tell I tell people how awesome he is. Um, so I say that Carl's a former dev, um, uh, and I'm not a dev. So the idea of this talk today is that you don't need to be a developer to be able to use APIs. It's all going to be about how you can um, how you can use this amazing tool that you have at your fingertips, and it's going to be mostly uh, demos today as well. So what is an API? So if you've not heard of an API before, an API is an application programming interface. So in its kind of most basic terms, it can be used to talk to an application. Um, so we're kind of used to the idea of, of a user interface or user experience, you know, kind of going onto your you know, Facebook, your Twitter, um, your Outlook and things like that. And you're using those tools and those buttons and, and those, um, you know, controls inside of those programs to actually talk to the, talk to the interface via the user interface. Um, an API is more of an application interface. So you can have to send stuff in a certain format for it to understand, and then you get data back as well. So what can an API be used for? So they can be used to 
do things like perform actions. So create records, read data, etc. In the last presentation we just saw, um, that custom portal probably used the Dynamics API to pull data from it um, that can be then referenced in that portal. And then when people submit those records, those go back into the Dynamics system, again, all via an API. So it's kind of real world examples of using APIs right there. There are different API protocols like REST or RESTful APIs and SOAP. Um, these just mean that the data and the, the way you go about structuring things is just slightly differently um, than, than all the methods. We also can secure APIs in different methods as well. So we're actually going to go through these methods today. We're going to go through API keys. We're going to go through um, authorization and no auth as well. So the what we're trying to what we're trying to hopefully alleviate today is the the idea that APIs can be tricky when you're not used to using them. Um, if you're not familiar with what an API is, it can seem really scary. You know, you have all these different languages like JSON and RESTful APIs and auth authentication and things like that. But it's not that bad once you get used to it. I have like I think at the start of this week I was wrestling with an API myself mainly because the author the uh, documentation wasn't correct and it was just more about working through those issues working through those problems and I got there in the end it's not a big scary thing it's something that anyone can really do and you can get started right away and we'll get, go through some resources later on so uh, using an API in Power Automate demo so this is my demo um, I think is it my demo your demo? No, no, no. Come on. Oh, okay, sorry. Your demo. Yes. Um, you can tell it's a Friday afternoon over here. Have you had beer yeah. already? No, no. Well, if I if I have, it's not alcohol. So. Yeah, you don't. You do, yeah, you say you don't drink these. Right. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you um, a few things. Um, I'm going to make this bigger and zoom in a bit because we need to um, show you this stuff. So um, the premise of this is, is that we, this is going to be a very simple API that we're going to call. Um, but the first thing that we need to uh, work out is where can we see all these public APIs? Um, and then there's a GitHub site that is explicitly for that. So this is all maintained by the community to, to show you all the public APIs that are available to, to you to use. And these are all your public ones. These are not going to be your Microsoft endpoints or um, things that are in your Salesforce data or wherever else it is. These are very much um, public facing ones. Um, and this GitHub link based on Matt's, it's in our um, Matt's links later, um, basically runs through and tells you all these different things that you, you've got access to if you've really wanted to. For example, if we're back in uh, the, the Montgomery County, um, we might want to understand what the weather's doing. So we can you know, use those weather APIs to understand whether we might see an impact on, on the, the weather on our services that we provide. And there's a whole host of APIs available to you, whether they're free or, or not, to, to bring you that, that data into your application. And you bring it in for, via Power Automate into your Dynamics environment if you need to, or into your Canvas app or whatever else. And this um, website is basically listing us what authentication we need. So we, some of these are just open and don't need any authentication or whether they're secured by HTTPS or not. Um, and whether we've got, um, I can't remember what that stands for, but um, another security principle there. And some of these um, are just an API key. So they, they may be a free site, um, but it, that might limit you to the, the the content that you get and the number of times you can call that API. Um, and if you then register or you pay for the service by uh, providing the API key, um, you'll be able to use it more frequently or get better quality data. So like I said, there's an awful lot of these. Um, but um, what the one that I'm go we're going to use for our demonstration is this um, I can has dad joke. So I can has dad joke. If you call that API, um, gives you a um, a dad joke. Um, my dog used to chase people like on a bike a lot. It got so bad I had to take his bike away. These are the sort of things that um, for the fathers out there um, we we use all the time on our kids. And there is an API that you can call 
that will 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 return a dad joke when you ask for it. So you just call the API, it sends you back the joke, and then you can use it. And that's just a bit of fun, right? It's not going to be serious, but it sh shows you the premise. And that dad joke is free to use. There's no authentication. There's just a HTTPS link. So how do I call that within Dynamics? Well, the premise here is that um, I am going to send Matt a dad joke every day um, until he tells me to stop. And you can see that I have been running it every day for every for quite a while now, and he still keeps responding. So he's yeah, yeah. not. I'm not turned it off yet. Maybe it's about time. But um, the idea being is that what we're going to do is set up a schedule and send out him an email. And this could be, um, you know, um, going to the wrong edit. This could be that that you know you could you could get the weather every day and send it out to your guys in the field. You know, make sure that you know that in in your area, the neck of the woods, and within your area, we're going to have um, a cold front coming through and make them knowledge. Or you could build up a whole group of information that, that's rel reliant to your workers and, and get them to understand it and combine with their list of tasks that they need to do for the day, with the weather, with, with some other things, with maybe some news or local snippets that there may be maybe traffic that's a problem on certain areas. As you can see what I mean, we're, 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 we're combining that data with, with, uh, with other things. But just to show you that it's not uh, difficult, um, we'll just run through this. So this is the, the power automate inf interface. All we've done is a trigger for a recurrence, which is basically going to say that we're going to be running this every day. And, uh, and we're just basically setting a time when this is going to run. So basically, it's going to run every day um, at uh, at nine o'clock um, uh, in the morning, which translates to 10 because this is all done within the, the UTC time zone. And all I do is call that API. So we're using a get method, and these methods can be um, uh, listed here, get, put, post, patch, and delete. And these basically means it, it's a standard um, way of calling APIs. A get meaning we just want to retrieve information. Put means we want to um, add information. Post is meant we want to call an action and provide detail. Patch is where you're going to update um, and delete, just like it says, you're going to delete information. And these are the standard verbs that the people use to, to understand their APIs. And, and we're getting into that standard terminology. But I'm going to just use a get. And I'm going to just pass in that URL. And the key bit here is that I, I want to return a JSON object. So by passing this as the accept, I'm telling it I will only accept back a JSON object. Um, um, JSON being another markup language to to format your data. So it's all just a string, but it just formats the data in a particular way. So let me just test that and uh, see what happened. Um, on the right hand side, we can see that we're, we've already tested this flow and this and I can reuse the one that Matt got sent today. So if I run that through and, and just check that out and see it in action. He says. It's doing a bit of saving, um, even though I had nothing to save, but that's Microsoft being over cautious. So we get the call. And you can see the output. Want to hear a joke about construction? Now I'm still working on it. So pretty poor jokes, really, but you know, which proves a point. Um, and this next action is the parse JSON. So we're expecting this JSON back, and you can see this is in the string here. We've got the idea of the joke. So if we ever wanted to go back and find the actual joke, we could do the joke itself and the status, which is basically saying I'm good. 200 status means good. Um, and we convert that into something that we can use. And that's what that parse JSON does. And then all I'm doing here is going to be sending an email with options. And what that means is Matt is presented with a formatted email um, with two options, a yes, please and no. Where where is the um, let me just show the um, um, and he said yes at that point. Hopefully he said yes, please. So we're now going through a condition. So he said yes, and then we jump into sending getting another joke. Um, what is the difference between ignorance and apathy? I don't know and I don't care. 
and we send it send that to him as well. And you can see into this other one where we formatted it. And I'll just go back to the edit screen so you can see what I'm doing there. So this send email with Joe options is I'm hard coding Matt's email address, um, but I'm basically sending him the joke of the day, which is the joke from that uh, object that we we've now parsed and into something that we can use. Um, and we're basically saying um, whether um, the what options we want to present to him. So those are the two buttons that will, will get presented to Matt, either a yes, please or no. Um, and that's very simple. And then we we do the same here. If we if we get a yes, please response, we send him that other joke. And then again, in that formatting, we send him the new joke um, directly. So very, very simple. But it, it just shows you and it just proves the point, really, that calling the, H, H, the, the API was very, very simple. It's a very much a simple get and we get information back and we and basically use this as your starting point to get into other APIs. Matt? Um, so yeah, really simple use case there. Um, so what I am going to do um, is I am going to show you uh, a slightly different one, uh, and it's, it's equally amongst the, the same things. So um, we were just drawing something in Power Automate there and um, sending sending me an email. But what I'm going to show you instead is my cute and fuzzy generator. Um, so the very first API that I connected to was an API um, to try and learn about APIs, and it was it was an API that just um, went off and found pictures of cute and fuzzy animals. Uh, that's it, mainly cats. Uh, just I'm a cat dad. So um, what I have here is my cute and fuzzy generator. Whereas it's a little, it's just a little canvas app. All you do is you push the button, uh, and as you push the button. It goes off and it goes and finds me a cute and fuzzy. Like that one. Oh, that's cute. It's a little, little small bean. Um, so that's all it does. It just goes off and just finds out and press the button again. And it's trying to go find a new image. So it's nice and simple. Um, nothing too too um, bad there. Um, how it actually works in the background is I have a canvas app. And again, like all, all these, we're, we're trying to show you the the basics here that the simple ways in um there are like real world examples of it but this is this is a uh, much much cuter uh much funnier unlike charles jokes um i i opened my my app too early and it's gone now i'm time out so hold on we'll edit that this is the problem of being too prepared so this is just a basic canvas app and it's just got a few different controls on it that do different things. <clears throat> Once it loads. This is the part where we probably need another joke. Or questions. Does anyone have any questions so far? I, I have a question because I'm not new to APIs. I've always been kind of told that you shouldn't really put stuff into your system that's not Microsoft supported um, in case it breaks. Have you ever come across where you've used something and it breaks and then you don't have an ability to kind of fix it from the community? No, it certainly is support. You know, API linkage is supported and I think now we're getting into more standards and, and more openness about that. There's, there's less of a threat or a risk there i would say because we're um yes the we're we're calling we're requesting and you know you've always got to be certain of what you're asking for um but um now we've got into these standards etc and we can protect them with with known methods and ways then i'd be a less a risky at that point for me yeah i'll, I'll back you up on that carl um you know that the, the the standard for a long time was with Microsoft products, don't do anything that's not out of the box. Um, but like Carl said, now that they're they're moving towards uh, established web standards, um, using things that are, are against written standards makes them safer because they're likely to last a lot longer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right, <clears throat> my cute and fuzzy generator. So, um, so this is my my Canvas app, um, and all my Canvas app does is it's just trying to call a flow. Um, so we can see up here, 
Um, this is me calling my flow and telling it to run. And then all I'm doing is I'm saving a, um, a variable in my Canvas app called picture data var. Uh, that's what this set command does. So this is all um, PowerFX. So if you're not familiar with PowerFX, uh, it is a language that you can use in um, Power Apps. It's coming to model-driven apps in the future. Um, so you will see this more and more. Um, it will give you a bit more power uh, than you currently have. So it's really useful to start learning this now. It's all kind of based on Excel as well. So should be hopefully very familiar to a lot of people. Um, in the middle, is where I have my uh, my image, and this is an image, and all this is doing is just just saying, right, give me the um, whatever that variable is, and then give me the picture response, and that's a piece of data that I'm getting from my call to Power Automate. So as I click this button, the um, the flow will run, and it will go back, it will grab the data, it will put it into a variable, and then I'm just going to show whatever that is there. So all good. Um, so how does this work then? So very similar to what, what Carl had. Um, I just have my trigger from Power Apps. So this is this bit here. And then my HTTP method, uh, again, is another get. I'm using the cat API um, because that's just awesome uh, to see that. And I'm using an API key. So when I went to this API site, they said, right, all you need to do is in the headers, which is this bit here, set this x dash api dash key and then give me your api key this is a free key you can use it if you want uh, or you can just go generate your own um, i don't think it even requires an email address um, and then you get access to their api so this is this is using uh, an, an api key to do that um, i'm then doing the same thing as carl and i'm parsing the json that i'm getting back from this http call so json stands for javascript object notation and it is one of the most commonly used notation languages for APIs. So if if you see JSON and you're afraid, don't be. It's, it's really easy. Um, there's loads of great videos out there on how to uh, understand JSON and how to how to work with it. But it's a very common language, and it's also what you will see in Power Automate in general. So as you're using Power Automate, as you're doing things like listing records in Dynamics, as you're like getting records and things like that, most of the responses are actually coming back in JSON, um, and it's just really powerful and really worth using. Uh, getting scripts with. Um, then all I'm doing is I'm uploading that um, the the URL of the image that I'm getting back to my OneDrive, uh, and I'm putting it into um, into a picture called cats.jpg, telling it to overwrite each time, and then the last two steps are to just get that cat picture back, and then the picture response is this picture response here. So I'm, I'm collecting the whole um, the, the whole response back and I'm taking just this picture response and that's what I'm using here. And all I'm doing is I'm just formatting it into a, a data URI uh, from that body. And that's that's all it is. It's not not super complex. It's just formatting a certain way so that power apps can understand what I'm sending back. Um, so all it does trigger it. It goes to the API. It sends an API key. We get a response back with an image. We parse the JSON, we upload it to my OneDrive, and then we can see it in my cute and fuzzy generator. So a nice and simple use case for how to use things like images in APIs. So, uh, and with that, oh, sorry, sorry, Matt. I it's okay. was hoping to ask a question about the yeah. flow there on the, um, yeah, there down at the response to Power App for flow. Yeah. If you put in more outputs, does that make them available in the, the variable on the other side? Yes, it does. So, okay, and, um, yeah. And it, it looks like it's not case sensitive then? Uh, no. Okay. Awesome. I, cool. I, that, that's I've all I've never realized that. So it looks like it's connected there over to the other side. So the, you'll be able to access all that from your Canvas app. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So usually when you submit your flow back, you could uh, just use this dot notation to then access any of those outputs. So I'm saving everything that I'm getting. Um, instead of specifying um, specific columns, I'm just saying, right, whatever this returns, put it in this variable, and then I can use that variable and any dot notation. So I just use that same picture data dot bar and have uh, picture response, have 
text response, um, you know, cap read, that sort of thing. And I can use all of it um, from uh, Power Automate in the Canvas app, which is super cool. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand back to Carl to show you uh, the awesomeness at the end. <laughs> Can you? Yeah, I'm on. Right. Um, so we've we've seen two fun ways to um, use APIs, um, and we've also seen that we've not really done any authentication apart from the API key. Um, we've not done any of the O uh, authentication, which is the the crux for a lot of these things. And um, if you're familiar, if you're a developer and, and those guys in Harry's team that are developers will, will know these sort of things that we need to authenticate all the time with certainly the Dynamics API and the wider Microsoft stack. And the premise for this one is to, is to start using the Graph API. So the Graph API is a um, API that Microsoft provides for us that we can easily get at information about our um, Microsoft 365 cloud environments, whether it's um, office information about our users or it's about teams, about groups, about um, to do lists that, you know, Microsoft are really focusing on this, the, the, the abilities of this API um, to allow us to see information that is, is there for uh, about our end users and keeps adding to it over time, all this new stuff that is available to you. Um, to go along with that, though, is obviously a security because you don't want to allow anybody to get at your environment and see your users email addresses or your memberships of um, teams etc so we need authentication and the way that microsoft does that is that you authenticate with the um the, the api you give permissions within your azure active directory for a particular api and you can provide a client and a client secret so that you're basically saying your application has rights to access this information and this particular sets of information. Now that's all very complicated and um, is a step beyond most um, citizen developers, as it were, in, the, in Microsoft terms or those business applications or the people that we want to really drive to make the applications and simplify. So what Microsoft has done is given us this custom connector which sort of bridges the gap. We can let the developer do the custom connector and create all that um, configuration and all that integration parts and set up the, all the all the um, permissions. And our citizen developers, our BAs, our, our functional teams can then reuse that in all their applications. Um, so let so our premise to to show you that is to allow. Um, a person to request access to a team within a tenant. So if you think about using teams outside your organization, you need to um, establish them as a guest user. You need to add them as, into a team and it's all very manual for the owner of that team and your um, ad administrators. But what this flow does for you is to allow you to publish a form which is what you see here, and it's a very simple uh, use case with with only a couple of, of options. But I'll, and then we submit that to the, the user submits this, and I'll do that just now. Um, let me just do a preview and submit it. So you can imagine this um, uh, is out in the wild, and um, we have got. Um, uh, I'm just going to put Philly in there because I know that um, that will work with my. It won't if I misspell my own name. Um, Carl, can you zoom in just a little yeah. bit? Thank you. Um, um, this this is going to send me an email and, and be separate. It's still going to get to my uh, Gmail address, which is fine. And I we can then select which team I want to belong to. So this is basically saying we could publish this to the internet and we could create this form and allow people to submit their um, request for access to a certain team. So if you're working with an external supplier or, or something like that, you could bring them into your team and collaborate with them on documents and everything else, but they need to come in first. So I'm just going to submit that so that we can see that go through um, and um, we'll see that editing. But let's look at what's behind that. Um, 
So in Power Automate, there is um, several, uh, several, there's thousands probably now, triggers and um, um, to associate it with different things. And one of the ones that we're using is when this new response is submitted, which basically means every time a response to that form is submitted, it will trigger this flow. So here we're basically saying um, when a response is um, submitted to that form, and that's the rec this is the form that we've established, go and get the details of that response. Now, there's a few actions that Microsoft provides us for Teams. Um, so we're going to use one of these here to basically establish um, all the teams that are in my organization um, because it won't get low and get me an individual team. I can probably do that through the Graph API, um, but I just wanted to show you the different ways of working here. Um, here we're going to list the teams and then we're going to filter. And what we're just basically doing is filtering what returns, what is returned, which is that full list of um, teams and he's filtering it by the name of the team that was selected by the user. So once we've got that, we basically need to go and get uh, from that uh, our team that the ID, which is what this little compose is doing and that all that is doing is saving me time doing repeating the same action later on. Um, I then go and use my first custom API call. Um, so let's go and jump into that custom API and show you that. If I can remember which tab it's on. Let me just go and do it directly. So on this left hand side, you've got custom connectors. Um, we can establish um, where it's going to which is this graph.microsoft.com, which is the, the central um, endpoint for all your graph um, information. We establish a security, so we're providing a, um, it, we're going to be using Active Azure Active Directory, we're going to be using a client ID in secret, which is maintained by your Azure administrator and will be given to you. Um, and we, the, the steps to go and establish that um, available um, and is pretty common. Um, and we we that those two together will provide you the 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 rights to whatever you need to do. So I've given this over in my graph API configuration. I was zooming on that as well. Rights to use certain things. And that's all linked back there to that. Um, where is it? Uh, client ID and secret that's going on as well. So linking those together, put secure in your environment all the time. Uh, um, and then basically after that, we define what we need to do. And we, all this is doing is, is wrapping around an API call. It's making that all easier for you to maintain as one central place and publish it to your end users. So you can see here on the left hand side, we're actually calling different things. One of the ones that we've just called is get owners. So get owners is an API call. So you can see it here. It's that graph.microsoft.com again, but with different parameters and we're passing in a team ID. And what we want to return back is a list of owners. So rather than doing that API call directly within flow and doing all the security, which which is possible, um, we need to be able to do it in this wrapper, which allows us to authenticate and, and run it as a, as a, a separate um, object. OK, so we'll now go back to my flow. We've got the owners and we're doing that parse JSON that we, we've done on every single one of those um, uh, calls so far, far. And what we want out of that get owners is just the email addresses. And what that means is it will give us um, using these two, two commands, I'm basically asking for the email addresses for all the owners and, and then, then what I'm going to do is start an approval. And this is very simple approval mechanism that Microsoft gives you out of the box. Well, not very, it can be very complicated. But if you've never used approvals before, it basically gives you a, um, a, a, a button within your email client. Um, it gives you another set of uh, an interface with either got a flow application or within Power Automate itself, because I've got action items there. Um, but it allows you to present the user with a 
uh, approve or um, uh, reject options um, and more if you wanted to. But it allows you at that point to establish whether um, and, and takes away all of that having to log into an application and, and check the information. You're providing that information in a very simple way for the, guy, the guys to be able to just click on the button and go on. So it's it's moving that um, separate. It's moving um, all those things into the hands of uh, managers and all the rest of them that may not need to log into the app every time. So you can use this for lots of other different premises, maybe um, approving opportunity quotes and all that sort of thing, um, where your the senior management not necessarily need logs into Dynamics every time. All I'm doing here is basically populating that email with information that I've got off that original form. So my first name, my last name and my email address and which team I'm actually linking to. So if the owner is, a, is the, uh, the person is an owner of many teams, they can establish which team it is. And then as we go down here, we basically whether whether it's an approval, um, I'm not doing anything in the no branch here. So if, if they if it's not approved, you may want to send out an email to the original person to say now it's been rejected. Contact Joe to go and see why, etc. Or in the approval, you can actually add a comment. So you may want to include that into your your no process. Um, excuse me. So. Once we've done that, but if we're on the positive side, we, we again use our custom connector. And what this one is doing is basically going to check whether the person that's had the email is already a member of our organization. And what that means is a guest user of our and, and an organization. So we don't have to send them an invite. If, if you've used multiple tenants before within Teams, um, you get an invite to join their tenant as a guest user, which gives them the, the you know, that 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 permissions and that synchronization between your your account and the, the, the guest where you're going to be in a guest. Um, so if they are already a member, we don't have to do that step. So it basically saying if we can go and get a user with that where their email address is the, the email that, that they've established. If it's a yes, we just straight add them to the team. If it's a no, we go and invite them and then use the output of the invite to add them to a team. So hopefully if I go and have a look at this in action, because um, I ran it earlier once I started this, you can see we're running. So this is a running when I started my chat eight minutes ago. Um, we can see that my flow is running. So I submitted this um, I got the response details. So you can see that um, my uh, information was passed here. Um, I've gone and listed the teams, so bringing back and this is all in the JSON string object, all the teams that I've got on my um, demo tenant. And then go and filter and compose and then go and call this get owners. So the get owners for the team ID that, that have established um, um, and that's returned information about that, the owners of that team. So it's me, I'm the owner of that team. So I, I'm quite happy with that. Um, and then here I'm waiting for an approval. So nothing's going to happen until I approve that. So I'm just going to go and approve that. Um, and if I go to approvals here, you can see that this is the approval that was sent through. And if I, we can do it in this interface, I've also received an email. Um, I can do that wherever I want. And all I need to do is go and look at that. Um, you can see once it comes back, it's sent to me as the owner. Can please confirm if if me with the email address of Carl Cookson at, at philly.gmail.com should be added to your team. At this point, I can I've got an approve and reject. I've also got reassigned. So if I think, oh no, I'll go and check this with Matt, then I can go and send it over to Matt if I wanted to, for him to approve. But I'm just going to approve that and confirm. Back in my flow, uh, there it is. Uh, you can see, hopefully, that we're, oh, we failed this time. What's happened there? So I went and got my. Um, user and it has fallen over so at that point it's fallen over you must not like that plus i was not saying it's a plus 
Yeah, I didn't realise that. I must learn something new every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if I just do that again and run through that with uh, a different response. Um, and then myself to that team. Um, and hopefully that will work. Uh, approvals. I've got my new approval in. I'm going to quickly approve that one. Uh, go to the run history um, and you can see this one's just started. Um, and we've now gone all positive, all nice and green, shiny ticks and we have all successful. So we've got a user. We didn't get a response at this point. So this my work email account is not known. I then go and create and invite them to the session. So if I looked on my Avenard email account now, I would see um, a request to join a tenant um, and then I add them to a team. If I quickly go and show you the output of that within um, this team environment, if I go and look at the uh, managed team, I can see uh, the guests that are in this team now as and we've now got this test two, which is what my um, uh, Avenard email is against. So now they're a guest straight away within my team's environment and I can then collaborate with them as we as needed within this team and do whatever we need to do with them. OK. And that's Great. about all. So hopefully that will be. Um, shows you that, that you know, the, the APIs are not scary. They can get complicated with the graph API, but you know, go and reach out and take a look at what's available and particularly use those things that Microsoft provide us to go and establish different ways of working and, and automate our lives and make our lives a lot easier. Um, Matt, have you got closing slides? I do. Let's uh, share that. Um, so yeah, Carl's example gets a little bit more, more complicated. But essentially, it's just all about understanding what APIs are, those endpoints, those ways to authenticate and things like that, and the responses you're getting back. So they're extremely powerful and versatile. Thousands of applications that can be uh, accessed. There's hundreds in the open API category. So if you want to just get started and just have a play around with it and understand it, um, there's the link to the GitHub. There's also public APIs, the IO, the chat API that I showed you today. Um, and just one thing I want to say is that we've kind of showed you a couple of silly examples and then a real world example. There are so many ways you can implement APIs into your dynamic systems from things like um, uh, different currency conversions, um, whether if you're an engineer and you don't want to be up at, you know, 50 feet in the air when it's like, you know, 20 mile an hour winds and stuff like that. There are so many ways you can implement them. And this is just hopefully to try and get you started and understand um, how these things work. So hopefully it was educational and it gives you some ideas of what you can do. Uh, and thank you very much, Heidi, for letting us come here and talk today. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. That was an awesome presentation. Um, we have like two minutes left, so I just wanted to kind of get an idea from everyone that's still on the call of what you might want to learn about at our next meeting, which should be in September. Um, so if you have any thoughts now, you can put them in the chat. You can come off mute. You can email me. I'm going to put my email in here for you. It's Heidi at reenhance.com. It's hard to type while you're talking. Um, otherwise, I want to rope around to Jeanette if you're still here. Jeanette, I know in your in your introduction you mentioned you had a question about Outlook that you were hoping we could talk about. More APIs. I like Thank these. you. So, yeah, <laughs> what's your question? Maybe we can help you out. Thank you. We're actually uh, going live with the Outlook app um, in a couple of weeks, and one of the issues that we've hit um, is when we launch the app, we're getting a pop up and should uh, oh. and I've, I've scoured the boards it seems like this has happened for some other people but i haven't been able to find an answer um hang on a second i'll get it and then i'll pop the message in the chat sounds good i see we have some ideas for more sessions tristan wants to hear about canvas apps that's cool 
that. Aiden wants more APIs. Also, if anyone is interested in presenting how you use Dynamics in the Power Platform like Harry did, we would love to feature that. I personally absolutely love seeing how people are using the system. I, I find it very interesting and I ask a lot of questions. Sorry if you don't like questions. All right. Any other questions while Jeanette is looking for her error message? Anyone else having a problem in your system we can talk about? Also, we're at the end of our time, so if you need to drop, feel free to drop. Totally understand. Good luck to Nick, who's going to get his second vaccination today. Anybody else who's having fun with that? Hopefully we're not in Harry's app in the future. <laughs> I'm getting my first vaccine tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Exciting. Good luck. Happy stick. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I appreciate all of the comments in here. I tried to drop in some of the documentation. So if you want to reference the chat later um, and you can click on the slider tab if you want to see our word cloud, it looks pretty fun. It's a good mix of different <laughs> words describing your CRM system right now. Matt and Awesome seem to be the leaders of it. Here, I'll screen share it again if you're not on slide. Got some great things here. And oh, then I'm having trouble even getting into it. <laughs> uh, you know what, tonight you feel free to to comment in I'll the add chat it to the here because I yeah I, I'll take yeah. a look and you can you have my email address if I can help you can send it out. I do. Great, awesome. thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you everybody so much for joining us and look forward to our next meeting. It'll probably be the second or third Friday in September. So hopefully we see you all there. Um, and thank you to our fantastic speakers. That was great, Carl and Matt and Harry. Thank you so much. And have a great afternoon if you're across the pond or morning if you're here in the Philly area. All right, thanks guys. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank, thanks for presenting, Heidi. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye.